we should be able to go. Great. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I can see we've got some numbers online as well as people here in the room. Um, I'm Tegan Cruis. I think most people here know me, um, and I have the honour to introduce our speakers who will be leading today's session on cultural safety. Um, but I want to get started with an acknowledgement of country. We're meeting, of course, on Ngunnawal and Ngambri land. Um, Cambria in particular is an important and significant site, as I think a lot of people know, in terms of groups of people coming together to learn from one another. Um, and I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us here today. Um, I also want to acknowledge that sovereignty of that land was never ceded. And so while we have the honour and privilege of working and living on this land, that that has come at a very great cost to people in the past and in an ongoing way. So there are three reasons uh, that uh, I would like to bring everyone together for this event today. Um, it's, this event has arisen from the work of our Equity and Diversity Committee in Psychology prior to the merger, um, and the purpose of today's event is twofold. So we're going to hear from some of our PhD students who have been at ANU throughout their training and have really generously agreed to share their lived experience and to be, I think, uh, quite vulnerable and honest with us about what that experience has been throughout their ANU training, um, and I think we're really lucky to have that opportunity. And they're also going to discuss some practical tips for building cultural safety in the classroom, both, both based on their experience as students, but also as tutors um, within our programs. So while this event's been prepared for and by psychology uh, as its primary perspective, uh, I would like to think that it has applicability much more broadly than that. Um, so those who are joining us from other disciplines, I hope you find things that are useful here today, and we really welcome you um, to the discussion. So there are three things, as I said, uh, this is four on the slide, there are three carrots and one stick um, in terms of why I think this is important for us to discuss today. I want to see if I can get rid of this panel so that you can all see my slides. Um, let me see here. There's a, I've seen you do it in the past, Nicole. So do you want to show us your expertise in putting that little thing down? Beautiful. Thank you. Just pop that up into there. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so three, four reasons why cultural safety should be on everyone's agenda and is everyone's business. Um, the first one is I think that we have a moral and ethical responsibility to right historical wrongs. We have to develop an inclusive science and a welcoming learning environment for everyone. This responsibility extends particularly to issues of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander psychology, given that we're the national university, but it also goes beyond that. Um, the historical wrongdoings have been perpetrated by our field. Psychology has been implicated in things like eugenics and scientific racism. So we have a responsibility as the custodians of that knowledge to right those historical wrongs. I think that's the most and obvious reason why psychology needs to engage with these issues. Um, and of course, that extends to many cultural minorities and other marginalized groups around the world as well. The second reason why this should be on everyone's agenda is to do with student well-being and educational performance. As educators, these should be really high priorities for us, of course, and there's plenty of evidence that cultural safety improves these outcomes. Um, hundreds of studies, in fact, demonstrating the link between students feeling culturally safe and them having better mental health and better performance in terms of their learning. So if that's our priority, then it should be um, a, a very high priority for us to invest in cultural safety. So our presenters are going to be able to speak about their experience um, going through our training program. Um, and I think if we can listen non-defensively to some of those weaknesses, yes, there are strengths as well, but some of the weaknesses um, in terms of their lived experience. And I think that lets us improve the experience for future cohorts. Um, so as I said, I, I encourage everyone to listen non-defensively to the feedback in terms of where we can improve. The third one is around the quality of our science. So in psychology, we love to think that our theories and our principles are universal. That's one of the things that psychology has always been keen to assert. Um, but on the other hand, I think one of the things that we can agree on, despite the breadth of our field, one thing that interests everyone in psychology is that our perception is never objective, that we see the world through a lens. We can't not see the world through a lens. 
And so there's always going to be subjective elements to our experience. Our students can't learn how to do critical analysis if we only ever present one perspective on psychology and on the world as the correct perspective. So I think it's actually to do with improving the quality of our science and our commitment to psychology that necessitates that we embrace and invest in cultural safety as an issue. This means that the content also has a breadth of applicability that goes beyond any one sub-discipline or indeed discipline too. What I'm hoping as part of this workshop is that we're going to build a space within our school where it's safe for people to try new things, to be brave and creative with how they engage with these issues in their teaching, um, that it's okay to try things out and maybe not always get it right first time, but to work towards doing things better. So that's definitely our goal with today's session. Now, as I said, if there are three carrots, there's also a stick, um, which is accreditation requirements. So as anyone who's at the teaching day earlier in this year will be aware, is that while we had a very positive feedback from our accreditation body in psychology on our teaching, one of the conditions that was placed on our training was to improve our investment in this domain. Um, so it's actually a requirement of our, of our programs that we lift our game when it comes to cultural competence and cultural safety in our teaching. So I think that's a, that's a fourth reason why it needs to be everyone's business. The last thing I say I want to say before I hand over to the team who are going to be doing the work today is really just to make the point that I don't think there's a politically neutral stance on these issues. So choosing not to engage is actually a way of signaling that you're okay with the status quo. Um, being passive is not being neutral. Um, it is still taking a political stance on these issues. So I hope that encourages everyone to, to be brave and to put themselves out there and to try new things and, and commit to learning and improving in this space. Okay, so I want to hand over now to our team who will be leading um, the content of today's session. Um, so there are three people who are going to be doing all the heavy lifting. The first is Dr. Olivia Evans, who many of you know is an ANU Indigenous like, postdoctoral fellow. Um, her role is primarily research focused, but she's been a generous and tireless contributor in this space, as many people have seen time and time again to our work in improving cultural safety. Our second presenter is Micah Kumada who's a PhD candidate who's looking at observer perspectives in social anxiety. Micah is particularly interested in understanding the behavioural and neural processes in perspective taking and social anxiety. And our final presenter today is Asil Sahib. She's a PhD candidate investigating the relationship between intolerance of uncertainty and emotional difficulties from an emotional regulation perspective. Please make our three speakers feel very welcome. Uh, so I will just say um, I'm doing a tiny part of the lifting and it's really Micah and Aseel that have put in the enormous amount of work into this presentation. But before they started, we thought um, a nice way to start would be to go into some of the sort of philosoph philosophical underpinnings of um, decolonization in particular, of which cultural safety is one of the sort of building blocks. Um, so just to start from an international perspective and from the perspective we're used to taking in psychology, um, in the, in America, um, there was an APA task force on Indigenous psychology, um, and they came up with these, um, sort of tenets of Indigenous psychology and, and I created sort of a mandate for in, um, psychology in, um, like in the US to, um, be more supportive of and embracing Indigenous psychology. So, um, they... Um, they outlined the four key um, things that define Indigenous psychology, so a reaction to um, the colonisation and the he hegemony of Western psychology, the need for non-Western cultures to solve their local problems through Indigenous processes and applications, and the need for a non-Western culture to recognise itself in the constructs and practices of psychology. Um, and then also, I, I always rub it on to my students uh, in culture and psychology about this last point, the need to use Indigenous philosophies and concepts to generate theories of global discourse. So not just treating Indigenous psychology or even other um, cultures' psychology as uh, separate to the global phenomenon of psychology, but as something that we should embrace and, and develop an actual global thing of psychology. And so down the side there, um, they have the... Um, 
the different processes that need to happen to improve um, psychology through this perspective. And the last one um, says it involves decolonizing research methodologies and practice. So this is something that US psychologists thinks is, think is a good idea. Um, and so I think um, cheekily that if US thinks it's a good idea that um, in Australia, we've also adopted it as well. Um, so um, I won't go too much into decolonization, but I do really recommend that um, people watch that video that's linked there if you get time. It's too long to show here, um, but it, it goes through how decolonization is for everyone. It's the work for all of us to do and not just for Indigenous people to do. Um, and it's, it comes from acknowledging past hurts, eradicating colonial structures, reflecting on what's still wrong and imagining a future where um, the intersecting experiences of the most oppressed are recognized and valued. Um, so it's really, it goes beyond reconciliation to really trying to unpack those colonial structures and the, the hurt that's been caused rather than just trying to move forward without acknowledging that. So I, I'm assuming that all of my psych colleagues will be aware of the APS apology, so the Australian Psychological Society apology, um, but I put this slide up just um, for our med um, colleagues who might not be aware of it, but in 2017, I believe, um, the APS made an apology to Indigenous Australians. Um, they apologised for a lot of the things that Tegan um, talked about and for also just standing silently as well. And so um, not only actively causing harm, but also not doing anything to um, stop harm from happening in the first place. And they committed to listening more and talking less, following more and steering less, advocating more and complying less, including more and ignoring less and collaborating more and commanding less. So that all being said, um, we thought it would be a good way to start this, um, this talk today by just going through some of the ways that we can decolonize as scientists and practitioners. So this is taken directly from my um, lecture on decolonizing psychology in my second year course, um, which is why it's sort of very text heavy. I apologize for that, um, but I'll try and go through it as quickly as possible so we can get to the good stuff. So first of all, um, uh, and most of this comes from um, a text by uh, Dudgeon, Milroy and Walker um, that goes through the ways that we can decolonize. And it's a very powerful text that includes a lot of the history, um, the ways Indigenous, uh, Indigenous people have responded to colonization and things like that. So I'd recommend reading that as well. Uh, so the first is to take uh, more than a mixed methods approach to our research and our understanding of, for instance, psychological processes. So um, the role of the bricoleur, uh, which when I looked that up, it said a bricoleur is someone who practices bricolage. So there's your definition. Uh, <laughs> So all research findings have political implications. As Tegan mentioned, we all bring a lens to our research. And although psychologists try and separate ourselves from the stuff that we do and be as objective as possible, that's just not like actually possible. So it's it, recognizing the um, political, social, historical context that you do that you work in. And that um, scientific narratives and stories are framed within a specific storytelling tradition. So journal articles and um, things like that, that we generate in Western knowledge, that's just a way of storytelling that we find um, is like that we give evidence, that we give weight of at weight to as evidence, um, but that's just our way of storytelling. And people from different cultures all over the world and all over time have had different ways of providing evidence and different ways of telling their stories. Um, so a bricoleur approach takes into account the processes, relationships and interconnections among phenomena in a complex framework that reveals multiple dimensions and perspectives. Um, and it's really about looking at across different disciplines, how the work that you do is influenced uh, socially, culturally, politically, and historically. Um, so I, I, as a social psychologist, I like to think that we already do this, but um, it can really come across in any of the research that you do and should be um, sort of a, a consideration that you make. Um, on to the next thing, transforming theories of psychology. Um, so this isn't me talking, but this is from Pat Dudgeon's article. Um, community um, social psychology and critical psychology have already gone a long way to transforming the way we think about psychology. Um, but it came from around the 1960s when it became apparent that clinical psychology just wasn't able to address broad issues of inequality and social justice, particularly for marginalized groups in um, different cultures. 
And so community psychology in particular emphasized this sort of broader picture of cultural, economic, social, and political and environmental determinants and was able to shift the focus to this more holistic view of health and um, social processes and things. And so psychology needs to continue the process of decolonizing by continuing to um, unpack the influence that individualism has had on us um, and other colonial, colonialist ideologies um, and the way they've been applied. And um, just going on, when we don't do this as psychologists, even when we're well-meaning, we can inadvertently support things like ethnocentrism and cultural racism by imposing mainstream methods. I think some of this as well comes up in what um, Asil and Micah are going to talk about in their experiences of the way that psychology is taught at ANU, or just in general as well. Um, and so uh, critical psychology is an important voice to challenging this, um, but as psychologists, we can all come together to, to try and um, be more aware of these kind of things in our um, research and teaching. Uh, the next way is developing an Indigenous psychology. Um, so as I was saying before, there's... Um, in sort of Western science, we have uh, particular kinds of knowledge that we give weight to and that we think constitutes um, empirical evidence and things like that. Um, and so one of the ways that Indigenous scholars have been fighting back is to produce um, knowledge in that way, to appease, um, to appease science, so putting together research um, that challenges mainstream psychological concepts, but from within those knowledge paradigms. Um, and so um, things like the Working Together textbook are a really good example of that. And if anyone is interested in reading this textbook or owning a copy, there are pallets of them floating around in the school, um, including in the med school and psychology. Um, so you can, um, you can find one, for instance, in the bookcase um, that has all the free books in the psychology building. And I know Stuart Sutherland has a bunch in his office as well. Uh, then there's taking, taking a determinants approach. Um, so studies show that protection and promotion of traditional knowledge, family, culture, and kinship significantly contributes to individual and community well-being. So again, looking beyond just the individual to recognizing that there are many drivers of ill health that fall outside the scope of what we generally consider to be health. Um, and psychologists need to be aware, not just of um, things like um, the social determinants, but also historical and political determinants that continue to impact on marginalised communities and particularly Indigenous Australians. Um, and understand that treating psychological problems or health problems often involves accessing not just healthcare, but also a wide range of different um, resources. Uh, and then we've also got to support cultural resilience. So allowing people to um, to maintain their cultural identity and their knowledge and um, uh, and providing resources for the whole community and not just the individuals to, um, to increase their resilience. Uh, so there's a lot of research now on the role that culture plays in um, assisting individuals, but their families and communities as well, including the Michael Weiss study here at ANU. Um, and cultural resilience requires that communities can adapt to social changes while maintaining their, um, their core identity as well. And as psychologists, we should be actively helping, um, helping that sort of cause. Uh, and then there's cultural competency, which comes back to what Tegan was saying. So as researchers and practitioners of um, psychology and um, psycho psychological scientists, um, the work that we do can only get better when we become more culturally competent and able to, um, to develop and use a number of tools to ensure that we're cognizant of the complex ways that, um, that people interact with one another, that people's backgrounds um, can influence their behaviors and decisions and the ways that things like privilege and dominance are constructed and maintained in the work that we do. And critical reflection is an important part of this. Um, so I hope today sparks a lot of critical reflection in everyone. Um, and, you know, it's not, um, and not defensiveness, but just the ability to reflect on, on how we can do better and, and how we've, what we've done in the past has been um, sort of informed by the previous ills of psychology, for instance. And then finally, the last way that we can decolonize psychology, um, particularly in Australia, is by building the Indigenous psychology workforce. Um, so these are some stats from the Australian Indigenous Psychology Education Project. Um, there is a massive deficit of Indigenous um, Australian psychologists in Australia. Um, we get about 1% to 2% of undergrad students, but we only have 0.7% of our workforce in Australia in psychology identifies as Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander. Um, and in a at ANU, in the School of Medicine and Psychology, um, I think I can speak on behalf of us when we say that we really want to help 
change this and we want to help bring in a new generation of Indigenous Australian um, psychologists. And one of the first steps to increasing these numbers is creating a culturally safe environment for them to come and learn in, which is the perfect time to hand over to our lovely presenters today. Yeah, I think you have to be here. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Micah. I use she, her pronouns. And my name is Isu, and I use she, her pronouns. And we're here today to talk about cultural safety in the classroom. So we want to start by sharing our own experiences. We have been fortunate enough to go through ANU as undergraduate students, current PhD candidates, and lab tutors. So we have had many different interactions as students and as teachers in the classroom. So we wanted to come here to sort of share what cultural safety means for us from this unique perspective. Um, we're very thankful for the opportunity to make a difference, and we want to be able to share as much as we can in the time that we have. So I wanted to start by sharing why we wanted to be a part of this. Um, I am an international student here at the ANU, and I felt very different when I first came here, which is about five or six years ago. Um, I couldn't really connect to other students as well. I didn't understand the phrases being used, and I couldn't relate to a lot of people. So it was quite hard for me because growing up, I was always in a multicultural environment, um, from the school to the country, and all the students I knew were expatriates or expats who moved around a lot. So we had very similar stories. Um, but here, I just couldn't really connect as well. Uh, and my first, year, my first year here was not that great. Um, and I also had a hard time growing up because I moved around a lot. I didn't really feel like home was anywhere, um, but everywhere at the same time. So it was really hard for me to sort of settle, um, especially here at the ANU. Um, I saw a lot of international students as an undergraduate student, um, but they tended to stick with other international students, and I felt that I should too, because that tended to be the easiest way to connect um, here at the ANU, and this sort of led to the mentality that we're not, that there's not many of us international students here, um, because we tended not to linger far from other international cohorts. Um, I remember talking to somebody about international students at the university residence I was staying in, uh, and that residence actually has a 40% international student population, but this person was shocked to hear that there were actually that many living there. In addition, I remember listening to a speaker at the ANU speaking um, at an event talking about how there was not that many international PhD students here, but that's sort of the experience that I've had is relatively unseen, relatively isolated. So I sort of wanted to be a part of this to share my experiences and provide an a unique perspective, um, an avenue for cultural differences to be acknowledged here at ANU. Uh, so for me, I want to be part of this seminar as someone who's navigated two cultures her whole life. I have firsthand experience in cultural norms, values, beliefs, and behaviors being human made. But even then, I fell into the trap of believing that the empirical and theoretical information I was learning in my psychology courses was objective because that is what scientific empiricism is predicated on. I completed undergraduate psychology honors at ANU and there were only two instances where this belief was shaken. The first was when I found out in the second year developmental psychology course that the DSM is not the universal classification for psychopathology around the world and that Europe used the ICD, for example. I was literally bamboozled in the lecture and it only came up because I went up to the lecturer to ask about it. And the second time was when I went on exchange to Canada. While all of my courses were psychology ones, they offered classes that ANU would consider more sociological under the name of psychology, such as the psychology of death and dying or the psychology of women. This meant I was exposed to research that my peers here have not. The other biggest cultural difference um, between the two universities was the research studies we learned about. Certain groups of participants were just missing in the studies my Canadian classes covered. There was no talk on collectivistic cultures or comparing American participants with East Asian ones. Instead, we only learn about North American empirical work and the most cross-cultural they got was talking about the impact of race, separating them by either being white, black, Hispanic, East Asian and other. After coming back from exchange and going through honors in 2020, which included the pandemic and the wave of Black Lives Matter protests, I realized something vital. We at ANU are taught to view psychological, psychological concepts 
as objective and that we can study them in isolation to all other human factors. But when we remove a person's identity, our blank canvas of a human defaults to a white cis hetero abled man. And I assume we all know how limited and de detrimental that is. So Paul Cotton describes it perfectly in 1990 that efforts to streamline studies by using the most homogenous population possible has filled medical libraries with data on middle-aged white men, referring to the many clinical trials that only included men. Other racial and ethnic groups have also typically been excluded in research. As a result, when generalizing past research findings and trying to extend them to unrepresentative cultural and societal groups, it can lead to misinterpretations and misdiagnoses. So a study by Ganon and colleagues in 1992 reviewed articles over 20 years from 1970 to 1990 in different psychological journals that we still use today. They found um, appropriate generalizations to different groups of sex, as in if a study used only male participants, their re result generalizations were to the male population. Um, by 1990, that was still ranging from 59 to 84% in journals. So even in, in 1990, there was still research making inappropriate generalizations to sex groups that were not representative in the sample. Imagine if that was also extended to other factors such as ethnicity. Thus, reflecting on this research as examples in lecture content without acknowledging the limitations and biases specific to the lack of cultural and so social representation is painting a false picture of objectivity and universality in the discipline. And so that's a massive failing in our teaching approach. Since becoming a PhD candidate and a tutor myself, I've already started getting my own students to think about whether certain theories would actually apply to individuals in war-torn countries or to question whether a survey item was tapping into neurotypicality instead. But I know we need to do more and on an institutional level, which is why I'm here. So what is cultural competency? Cultural competency is the awareness of other cultures endeavoring to learn from and respect the cultural perspectives of other people. There is no end goal. You are not culturally competent, but rather it is a lifelong commitment to being culturally responsive in your day-to-day -day life. There will be times where you'll be challenged, where you don't understand an individual's experiences, and that's okay. Alongside cultural competency is cultural humility. Not only should you have an awareness of other cultures, but also your own. Cultural humility is about understanding that your beliefs, values, and cultural identity shape your perspective of other people, the world around you, and even your behaviors. That's not to say that we should be basing our interactions with others just on their cultural identity. We cannot forget the interaction of group experiences and how a person's identity is made up of a multitude of social elements. Thus, we want to engage in cultural competency while also understanding that everyone is their own person. Now, as academics and research candidates, we all have graduated from some university, and so we have all been able to fit into the mold of what it means to be a university student. But what does that actually signify? It shows how well you accept and abide by the hidden curriculum of education. The hidden curriculum are the implicit and unwritten norms that are expected of students to intuitively know or develop through socialization in a classroom. For most people in the room, this means a Western idea of education. For example, students learn from teachers, not the other way around. You should always take the initiative to speak up during class discussions. Education should come first before a job, and we expect that we are being taught true facts. In the context of ANU, in labs, we don't need to raise our hand when we speak. Um, we can just jump into a conversation. In my culture, when in a classroom, you never speak unless called upon, you have to raise your hand. And I still practice that here at a university, and a lot of people have noticed that um, because that is an underlying ex expectation of students from my culture, which is different to those of ANU. Um, this made it hard to share ideas in my lab because I would either never get called upon or there were changes in who was talking one after the other before I got called. So I had to adjust my behaviors to align with the expectations of the lab environment. The hidden curriculum exists. There is an underlying expectation of a student's behavior that is affected by the dominant culture or societal norms of education in that context or country. As teachers, researchers, academics, you know the curriculum. And it's important to acknowledge that it does exist. And there are students that haven't engaged with the hidden curriculum before. It is our role to support them in their own learning experiences, whether or not that aligns with the hidden curriculum. 
This is why we are here, to provide some strategies to be more culturally responsive in the classroom. Although they may seem like common sense, we're here to tell you as students that we still think there's more we can do. Once again, cultural competency is a lifelong commitment, so there is always room for change. So for strategies, we'll be grouping them into three key areas to make it easier for everyone to remember. They are before, during, and after a lecture. So before a lecture, if there is any content requiring a trigger warning, it is important to release a statement beforehand so students are aware of this and not caught off guard and have the ability to not attend. Let me describe three different sub-disciplines in psychology that need content warnings as an example of how this applies to all of psychology. In psychopathology, it is commonly acknowledged and there is research to support that the idea about talk surrounding eating disorders or disordered eating are triggering for individuals with a history of eating disorders. Not providing a heads up during a lecture on eating disorders may trigger a spiral for some students. For social psychology, when using empirical studies that use harmful group labels, such as the KKK, a warning is needed. Maybe the study demonstrates an important social concept, but an alternative approach would be using other studies that do not remind BIPOC students of white supremacy. Finally, health psychology. Even events such as a named natural disaster needs to be content warned. You do not know the backgrounds of your students. Yes, they are a good example of the effect that sudden onset stressors can have on one's physical and mental health. But a student who is just typing away and is suddenly reminded about a hurricane that killed a family member, not okay. For medicine, it may be about content warning graphic images instead. Content warnings are not trivial and are important in all areas of psychology and medicine. Content warnings provide students with the ability to engage with the content in a safe manner, improving their overall learning experience. Also, students are coming into a new course every six months. So there is a natural power imbalance between students and conveners, as well as tutors. Um, as a student, I felt like lecturers were sort of in another world. Uh, with such a large student ratio during my undergraduate years, it felt kind of impossible to connect with conveners and tutors, which for me was difficult because I did come from a high school where I sort of knew every teacher and I could have random chats with them during lunch breaks, after school and after class. So before the start of the semester, it would be nice to have an introductory water post to let students know who you are and sort of try it to rebalance that power scale and allow that relationship to grow. And another strategy is for being more culturally responsive is releasing lecture slides beforehand. Um, and you might be wondering why this would be more culturally responsive. So here's an example. Um, we were a part of a joint seminar between ANU and Waseda University in Japan. English is not their first language, so we agreed to send our slides to each other so we could have a read through each other's presentations and prepare any questions we had beforehand. This provided a culturally responsive environment for English as second language researchers and created more engaging conversations because we had given them the opportunity to think through their answers. It did not lessen their engagement. In fact, it helped facilitate more conversations because they had a chance to look over the content first. Even though we read through the content, even though we read through the content already, we were still excited to hear each other present because the content was interesting. Similarly, at ANU, about a quarter of undergraduate students are international students, and there are thousands of students that have English as a second language. There are students that have children, that have full-time jobs outside of university, those who are carers, who are hard of hearing, neurodivergent, dyslexic, low-income households, first-generation immigrants, first-generation university students, and more. There are additional learning curves that have nothing to do with a student's willingness to learn, but everything to do with their ability to. We celebrate diversity, but we also need to accommodate for it. And providing lecture slides beforehand prepares students for the lecture. It can help them understand the content and come with questions so they're prepared to learn rather than type up every word a lecturer says and then look back at it later because they were too focused on typing notes to take anything in. So with during a lecture, uh, make sure to include an acknowledgement of country. This applies to labs as well. This not only respects the traditional custodians of the land, but also acknowledges the importance of the connection to country for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and being culturally inclusive to cultural backgrounds in Australia. This needs to be emphasized throughout your course and to tutors as during our undergraduate graduation uh, education, an acknowledgement of country was rarely done. Moreover, you should make attempts to diversify the way you present information. 
while the choice to either have more text heavy slides or only picture diagrams graphs is a personal one, the extreme preference for one is not culturally safe. Either extreme caters to one type of learner and alienates other kinds of students, which is no one's goal. A balance is ideal and incorporating different formats of knowledge sharing is desirable. For instance, including the uh, occasional video or a TED talk to summarize a complex theory or showing how psychological findings translate to the real world would strengthen your slides. There is plenty of scholarship out there already. It's okay to use it. You don't need to do all the work yourself and repeat what others have already done. If you're stuck for ideas or don't know how to change your presentation style, I would highly recommend looking at the eight ways of learning, which is an Aboriginal pedagogical framework. It demonstrates that there are eight different types of learning processes a person can prefer and highlights the importance of their interconnection. No one fits a single learning process exclusively, which obviously has implications for your teaching style, but there's no need for alarm. They're very easy to implement. So for example, I already implement learning maps in my labs, and I do this by writing up a short summary of the lab content and explicitly stating how each topic and activity is connected to each other and the course as a whole at the start of the lab. This helps certain students remember what they are learning by placing it in a bigger context. Another way is the deconstruct reconstruct process where you could show students the final formula and either work backwards or take each step and demonstrate how it connects to the final piece instead of going in a chronological matter only. This would be one way to teach statistics to students, which we know can be a challenge for some. Um, another key re resource that I found scouting the ANU website is the digital tool matrix, which was created by the staff education team here at the ANU. They've developed a comprehensive how to guide on addressing different goals in teaching, such as I want my students to do or apply something or I want my students to generate ideas. These goals are linked to strategies for in class activities, communication tools and digital tools to engage with the content. These icons are also all hyperlinked and clicking on them will provide more information on each of the different formats. They also highlight the licenses that ANU has with some of these applications. So the class activities are another great resource for anyone struggling to find different ways to incorporate new learning styles. Um, the Center of Learning and Teaching is a great part of the ANU website that reflects on different strategies for supporting students through workshops and blogs. This can be a great starting point for change. It's amazing how much of the ANU website goes unexplored and can be very helpful. Also, cover accessibility. There are many students that are going to can coming to Canberra and the ANU for the first time. Even seasoned undergraduate students only know about the buildings that they need to be in. So there are thousands of students at the ANU and it can be quite confusing to navigate. So it's important to start the conversation about accessibility. Where can someone go if they are struggling with lectures, course content, with English, if you need special consideration or deferral, deferrals? Mention who the Dean of Students is and what they can do for us as students. Another accessibility thing that I recently found out is that we can get transcripts from Echo recordings, which you should let students know if they need them to learn the material better. Another key aspect of lectures is the students. Allow them the opportunity to present ideas, ask and answer questions from lectures. One useful resource for this is Padlet. There are many more, um, but Padlet is an online resource where private discussion forum links can be created and anonymous collaborative responses, questions, or topics can be posted. This can be a good way to collect responses to questions in lectures. Also, because Padlet is an online format. It provides a way to include discussion topics into echo recordings, better facilitating students who are unable to attend the lectures due to clashes or are remote learners. So you can also use Padlet to get anonymous feedback or even set up short quizzes inside the lab or lecture to test students understanding of the content. Another thing is about respecting students and their identity, which requires refuting oppressive and hurtful comments about others. It is perfectly okay to disagree, pose a question, or have a different point of view, but there are ways of discussing things respectfully. So how can we go about responding to disrespectful commentary? It is important to take a minute to pause and think about your response, because in the moment, the immediate response tends to be interesting. Okay, I hadn't thought about it like that, or to avoid it and move on. 
However, think about the message being sent to students who might be affected by this. So it is important to have a response lined up for these sorts of occasions. I would also like to remind everyone that there's a difference between having a different opinion on say the best ice cream flavor and holding a belief that questions and harms the mere existence of a group. That is never okay, no matter how a student says it. A comment, a question, a philosophical quandary. It is unacceptable and must dealt, be dealt with correctly, which includes giving formal warnings. Next, acknowledge your lack of knowledge. Students expect you to be experts in psychology and medicine as a whole. So it's important to flag answers that are not in your expertise and communicate it with them. And our final point for during lectures, it's to include inclusive content. Provide readings from different cultures, not just European or American. Provide examples of different cultural models and empirical research from non-weird countries. In the medical sector, uh, provide inclusive medical models and inclusive patient types. For example, I know of a Black medical science student who went to ANU who attended a lecture with a paramedic as a guest lecturer. They were discussing ways to know if a patient was not receiving enough oxygen, which includes a symptom of turning blue. This student asked how to apply this to people with darker skin tones. The paramedic was unable to answer this question. And that's highly concerning. And we know that there are statistics showing that the implicit bias of assuming patients are white has caused delays in diagnosing BIPOC individuals, which harms their ability to access healthcare in a timely manner and worsens their quality of life. And now, we're have, going to ask Olivia to come back and to give us, um, go over some examples of how we can include inclusive content in psychology. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Psych 2012, which is convened by myself and um, Dr. Jun Wen Chen, uh, most of our content is, um, well, we hope it is anyway, inclusive content. Um, but I thought probably the best example and most expansive example um, comes from one of our tutorials, which was actually, um, these slides were designed by our amazing teaching assistant, Alicia Robinson, um, in conjunction with me and Jun Wen. Um, so in the second lab, our students um, uh, learn about cultural responsiveness in Australia. Um, the, this isn't the whole lab, um, so they start off learning about, a bit about um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, cultures, um, but then later in the lab, um, they, oh yeah, so um, they learn about why there's cultural sensitivity warnings, um, for instance, around using a person's name and image when they've, um, they've passed. Um, then there's a brief note on respectful language, so how can we... Um, how can we uh, talk about different groups of people in ways that's empowering um, and respectful? Um, and then, so that's the first part of the lab. It goes into some more historical things and some um, goes through some uh, parts of Aboriginal cultures and things like that. And then in the second part of the lab, um, we talk about different, uh, different ways of understanding um, different phenomena. So um, the first example isn't really about psychology at all. Um, it's about uh, the different ways that um, we think of seasons so different knowledge systems around the weather um so we have this example even in australia we use this idea of winter spring summer and fall um and i know anu even advertises itself as having four distinct seasons or something like that um, when you're applying for a job here um but actually i mean we have this thing called fake spring in Canberra because we get spring for like two weeks and then it goes back to being winter. Well, what if that's not actually true because those four things are just made up entirely. And in fact, um, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people would have had their own ways and do have their own ways of understanding the way the seasons change in this specific region. And um, on there's a um, map from the Yaru people of Broome um, where their year is split into six different seasons. Um, so that's, we get them start to start thinking about um, these different ways um, of thinking. Um, then we look at, um, we, we sort of focus in on psychology. Um, so we talk about the example of depression. So um, in Psych 1004, I haven't personally done it, but um, students learn about the serotonin hypothesis of depression. Um, they go through some of the theory on that, um, but then they talk about depression as an injury of um, the spirit, which is, um, an Indigenous way of understanding depression, um, which was um, uh, developed in um, Central Australia, or 
was around in Central Australia and has been sort of evidence since then. Um, and so they go through the features of depression, um, how it's treated and, and how this differs from the serotonin hypothesis. Um, and then we have a discussion component um, where um, the students in the lab imagine that they're a clinician treating depression um, of someone in Central Australia and discuss the uh, issues they may have with treating um, this client and whether you can make these two um, different models compatible. Um, and then um, we go into why the Western scientific method might not be the only way to gain knowledge. Um, so uh, this is an example of IQ. We won't do the whole quiz now, um, but there's a um, short quiz assessing your knowledge and intelligence. Um, so the first question, uh, which is the odd one out from these uh, answers? Does anyone want to guess? No, we have some very unintelligent people here. A wombion is, of course, because um, the rest of them are all uh, nations in Australia, I believe. Um, <laughs> We won't, <laughs> we won't go through all of them, um, but yes, so Munya's a head lice. They go through um, the whole intelligence test and then see how they score. Most of them do very poorly, um, but so it's designed to show people that IQ and knowledge tests have a cultural bias. Um, we think about intelligence as the capacity to solve problems and accomplish tasks, so it should be a me me measured according to the problems and tasks rather than some global idea of IQ. Um, and then we ask them again to reflect on this. Um, were the results of this test meaningful to them? And if not, why not? And what does that say about intelligent tests more, more broadly? Um, so they're just some examples of how we include inclusive content um, in Psych 2012. And um, I guess, yeah, Seal and Micah have both taught this course, so they might have more to say about it, but I'll pass it back to them. Oh, no. uh, yeah, so someone who's taught this lab this semester I think one student got a question correct and that was about it. So, but they're very good labs. Um, but back onto our wonderful script. Um, so understandably, it may be difficult for some of you to change an entire lecture, an entire course and or your teaching style. I know teaching is only one part of what academics and researchers do at university. However, the minimum you can do is flag the idea of a wider context in psychology research. Acknowledge the limitations of the research you present to students and that is just one perspective to psychology, to medicine, and be transparent about the foundations of the research you present. Let students know that there are other approaches to psychology and medicine that they can research from different cultural backgrounds that are not in the lectures. I had no idea there were indigenous frameworks to psychology or that diagnoses under the DSM-5 do not acknowledge cultural differences or culture-bound syndromes. I thought mainstream psychology equated to universal and objective psychology as an undergraduate student, but that's not true. In addition, engage in cultural humility. Be aware that a lot of the lecture content comes from personal expertise. Just as in research, a theory or new idea comes from a list of values, expectations, and assumptions that we have about the world. You don't know what you don't know. So when teaching students, our go-to is to be confident in sharing what we do know. And as a tutor, I know there are topics in psychology that I'm not well versed in. So when I teach this content to students, I make sure that students are aware of this. And I even let them know which tutors or lecturers from the course um, that they can reach out to who are better equipped to answer questions related to those topics. Also, evolve your content over time. Again, cultural competency is a lifelong commitment. So think about reviewing your slides every year. Take a culturally responsive approach and look at what different cultural aspects in your teaching content could be added or are missing and progressively include them. Now, the most important part about all of this is consistency. A study by Faulkner and colleagues in 2021 found that students felt cared for when community resources such as accessibility were reminded throughout the semester, not just on the first day. They also felt cared for when there were office hours for student teacher engagement, where teachers were present during that time. In addition, using verbal and nonverbal immediacy behaviors throughout the semester made students feel welcome and included. So verbal immediacy sort of reflects referring to students by their name, um, asking how they're doing and giving opportunities for students to share their thoughts. Nonverbal immediacy are behaviors associated with engagement, such as eye contact, smiling, and movement throughout the classroom. So this should be a long-term commitment to a student's learning experience throughout the semester. 
So moving on to after a lecture, the most likely experience after a, le after a lecture for academics and HDR candidates are students' interaction, either through email or in person. So it's important to be culturally responsive in your interactions as well. The most important part of a student interaction is knowing their name. Make sure you spell their name correctly in an email. When you first meet someone with a name you can't pronounce, your first reaction to making a mistake might be to say, I'm not sure if I said that right. But when you say that, you're isolating their name and are making a statement that their name is not what you're used to, which is in of itself letting the student know that they're different. Ask for introductions at the beginning of a meeting and pronounce their name with a question mark at the end so they are able to correct you. You may believe that asking if you pronounce it correctly gives them, a, them the space to correct you, but it does not. The natural power imbalance makes it very difficult for students to let academics know that they are wrong. So I let all of my tutors pronounce my name wrong during my undergraduate degree because I felt like I had no place to say that wasn't correct. And I just didn't, I didn't know how much that affected me because most people get my name wrong. But one day in third year, a tutor pronounced my name correctly and I was actually very relieved. Yes, and so for with me, no one ever pronounces my name correctly. Tegan did try, mm -hmm. we had a conversation about it, but no. Um, with So what I end up doing is I accept the anglicized pronunciation of my name, um, but it does physically hurt me when this happens, especially when I have to introduce myself with the anglicized pronunciation because our name's an important part of our identity. Um, but yeah, nowadays I just say, my name is Esil, but none of you are gonna be able to say it. So you can say Esil and I'll respond. And that makes everyone laugh. Um, another key part of student interactions is how we greet them. Mm -hmm. So I know in Australia, handshakes and hugs are very customary in day-to-day -day interactions, maybe not at university, but certainly in everyday interactions. However, where I'm from, we don't make physical contact with um, to greet people, we simply bow. So when people lean in for hugs, I do feel uncomfortable. And when I don't lean in for a hug, I feel like I'm being disrespectful. And it may look like that if you don't consider the cultural differences. Now with handshakes, it is almost impossible to refuse one, but it's a cultural practice that can end up crossing religious boundaries. By doing this, you are putting the other person in a situation of either doing something they are uncomfortable with or having to reject an already stretched out hand, explain why they don't want to do that and make the situation increasingly more uncomfortable for everyone, a lose-lose situation. But even without religious boundaries, physical contact can be uncomfortable for many people and there's actually really no reason for you to be sticking your hand out. Cultural norms are human made and are subject to change. So just say hello and keep your hands to yourself. So how you interact with students has a very big impact. I know as lecturers and students, you have so many students to look after that sometimes they get grouped together as psych students, med students. However, to them or to us, you are the only conveners, lecturers and tutors for those subjects. So to us as students, your response has a significant impact on how we see ourselves as students and how we approach the classroom. Let me give you an example. As a first year student, I came here taking all kinds of different subjects because I just didn't know what to do. Culturally, there was no such thing as a gap year in Japan, especially in my family. So I went to university in my first year as an expectation right out of high school, trying to figure out what to do. I moved so, so far from home and I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I really just did what I knew best, which was study very hard. Um, at the end of one of my first semesters, I actually received a physical letter in the mail. It was from a convener who actually congratulated me on my achievements in the course, my grade, and offered me the opportunity to talk to them if I wanted to continue pursuing this topic in the future. I still have this letter to this day. Now this letter might be incredibly generic, sent out to all high achieving students, but to me, I felt seen and acknowledged. It made me actually want to continue university. Now, I'm not saying that you should be sending physical letters out to every single one of your students, but I am saying that you need to create an environment with your students where they want to continue learning from you. Uh, another point we wanted to cover is allowing students to provide anonymous feedback throughout the semester. Yes, we have CELTs, but they mean nothing to current students. Having a place and model where students can provide feedback for the course once in the middle of semester or open throughout the whole semester provides an opportunity for current student experiences to improve. As a tutor, I always tell my students that if they are struggling with the way I'm teaching the content or they would prefer I do things differently, to always reach out and let me know. 
And finally, cultural competency is a conscious act, but it should not only apply in lectures, but in labs as well. So it is important to communicate to your tutors about being culturally responsive in labs, as all the points we've covered are also applicable there. In addition, I have already created a guide on how to be culturally responsive for tutors with real world examples on how I've implemented them. We'll be sending this out to you as a PDF so you can pass it on to all your future tutors. Now, this slide applies to assessments and markers. When you're creating a rubric for assessments, we recommend including a writing expression or clarity section in the rubric and explaining to markers that students lose marks for writing or communication only in this section. What can happen instead is that students will lose marks for their argument just because of how they write. There are thousands of students that have English as a second language, and it is important to be aware that this can impact their writing skill. You can read a good argument that is written with bad grammar or a clunky word choice, but that does not negate the strength of their argument, and punishing them for this is not culturally safe. In addition, make it clear what the guidelines are when it comes to assessments. People come to university with different levels of education, diverse backgrounds, and different styles of learning. So be aware that it can be difficult to adjust to the ANU standard of learning. Make time to address these standards and make expectations clear so that everyone is on the same page. For instance, I had no idea you can submit things late. In my high school, if you sub didn't submit on time, you automatically failed. So I also expected the same when I came to ANU. Now I'm not saying that you need to let students know they can submit late, but that you need to be mindful that expectations around how to write an essay or do an assessment can be culturally different for students. Just one thing to add on to that is, um, for example, if you have three essay questions that they're allowed to choose one from, make it clear that they're choosing one. I've heard stories of people misunderstanding that and writing an essay for each question. As lecturers, conveners, and researchers, we have the privilege and opportunity to visit other institutions to learn from them. But as an undergraduate student, all I knew was what ANU had taught me. So I had no idea that there were different ways to learn psychology or that there were very various parts to psychology that I wasn't taught until a transfer student told me about how their old university did things differently. So this is why it's so important to be inclusive in your content and relay to students that there is a wider context to psychology because they may not know otherwise. So for our last few slides, we wanted to do a little activity. So some of you may already be familiar with it, but for those who are not, positionality is the act of disclosing how one's racial, gender, class, and or other self-identifications, experiences, and privileges influence one's work. So today's activity provides a comprehensive statement of many possible factors that shapes one's perspective about the world. Uh, the goal of this e exercise is to question what we are missing in our interpretations of the world around us, acknowledging the complexity and variability of someone's life history and how that influences their perspective. Thus, the, through the activity, you will become more aware of why cultural inclusivity is important in teaching. So for the activity, I'm going to read through some of these questions and just have a think about what your answer would be to each of them. You don't need to say it out loud. You can share it afterwards if you want to, and obviously omit any answers that you don't want to share to the rest of the group. But you can also keep your statement to yourselves as long as you're sort of answering them as we go through. Okay, so first, where were you born? Or where are you from? What is your cultural background? What is your religious background? social class background? Do you have any academics in the family? What is your family dynamic? Are you a first generation graduate? Your gender? Sexual orientation? Where you went to school? And what type of school was that? Where did you learn psychology? What do you do at ANU? Why are you passionate about your point of expertise? Now, how has that passion shaped your view of psychology? So have a think about those questions. Um, I don't know if you've been answering it as I've been reading it. I don't know if I've read it too fast, but um, have a think about those. 
And now think about either the person sitting next to you or if you're on the Zoom, person next door, um, do you think that perspective matches the person next to you? Okay. Oh, oh no, no. Um, okay, so Mike and I will start by giving you an example of our positionality statement so you can provide as much or as little as you like if you want to share after us. So I'm a first generation immigrant being born in New Zealand and I moved to Canberra when I was eight. My parents come from West Asia, specifically Iraq and Kuwait, which added civilian of war experiences to my childhood and upbringing. Obviously, I'm a Muslim, which puts me in a unique position of navigating religion on top of cultures and recognizing this nuance between the three and also being a child in post 9-11. I and now belong to an upper middle class for my socioeconomic status, but that's because of my parents and that wasn't always the case growing up. I come from a very big but spread out extended family, but as far as I know, I'm the first to be in academia. My parents are married and I'm the eldest of three children. I'm not the first in my family to go to university, as having a university degree is the expectations for Arab. I am a cis woman. I attended multiple schools throughout my primary education, but they were all between Wellington and Canberra. All of my schooling was done through public schools with no tutoring. I've been studying psychology since I was in year 11, so age 16, in Canberra, and I did all my university study at ANU while also doing exchange at the University of Ottawa. Um, and that showed me how psychology courses differ even between Western countries. I am a PhD candidate and lab, tuna, lab tutor at ANU. Uh, my, what am I passionate about? I want to help people as much as possible by improving their mental health. And I believe that research and interventions on trans diagnostic factors are the way to go. So as a result, I always review research through the lens of how would this work in an intervention treatment scenario is it feasible? Would it actually help people? I guess you can say I'm a realist and I like looking at things from a practical viewpoint. And do I think that this matches my current? No, um, because both of my unique personal experiences and identities and also because I'm neurodivergent, which is an additional identity. So my brain is fundamentally unique from everyone. And as such, I'll always have a different perspective to others. And that's fine. We need different perspectives for better work. Um, so my, for my positionality statement, I was born in Tokyo, Japan, but raised in three different countries, America, Japan, and Indonesia. So my cultural background, although ethnically is just East Asian, I see my cultural background as sort of a blend of all the places that I've lived. Um, I grew up in a very Catholic household until I was about 14 um, when we moved to Indonesia. I come from a well-off upper social class. Even in my immediate, everyone in my immediate family has a bachelor's degree and one has a master's as well, which sort of brings on to that expectation of going to university. Um, I am not a first generation graduate, but I am the first PhD candidate. I have two younger siblings and my parents have been divorced for 16 years with a single working father who sort of came home after midnight and left before we woke up for school. My grandparents raised us throughout our youth. Um, I am female. I went to primary school in Connecticut and Tokyo and Jakarta for high school. So all the schools that I have attended have been private international schools. I started learning psychology at university. Um, I am a PhD candidate, tutor, and ANU alumni. My passion for my specific research is due to two things. First, I would say, well, I want to say that I am a quite an empathetic person, and I think it was because of some significant life experiences that sort of helped me see the good in others and wanting to be like that. Um, I used to say that disaster tended to follow me if I moved countries. So when I was two, I was in New York for 9-11. When I was 11, I was in Tokyo for the tsunami and earthquake. When I moved to Indonesia, there was a terrorist attack on a bus in my city. There was also a bomb threat at our school, which led to the development of a permanent police security checkpoint at our school entrance. So from all of those experiences, I sort of saw what humanity meant. I saw people helping each other, giving each other phones to call home, food to help those in shelters, volunteers helping out, choosing to risk their lives for other people. So this altruistic behavior, I wanted to understand it and why people were the way they were for better or for worse. So that sort of got me into trying to understand what being a person really meant, which led me to the study of psychology. And I really wanted to understand how people behave, think, and see the world differently from one another. So my interest in perspective taking, trying to figure out why people sort of have different perspectives. Um, 
Uh, second, I happened to take biology courses as an elective throughout my entire undergraduate degree, and I sort of found an interest in biology, which I couldn't pursue um, because of course requirements in my degree. But um, in particular, I found great interest in how the brain sort of affected behavior. So that's sort of how my interest in neural research sort of grew. Um, and from that point on, all the courses I took at university were related to my interest in psychology and biology. So for instance, I didn't take social psychology in my third year. I didn't take industrial and organizational psych psychology. So how I saw psychology was through the lens of how your brain affects your behavior and how we interpret the world around us. Then given the opportunity to do a PhD here at the ANU, my research focuses on just that because that's sort of what I was passionate about. And that was my version of psychology at ANU. Thinking about that, a SEAL's perspective in psychology doesn't match my own, but it doesn't make her view of psychology any less relevant or valid. They're simply different takes on the discipline. Anybody want to share anything? <laughs> More than welcome not to, that's all right. Anybody on Zoom? Yes, Joy. Oh, hello. It doesn't have to be as long as ours. We're just sort of like answering everything. Yeah. <laughs> and you can come here. Sorry. <laughs> All right, let me have a go. Um, okay, so I was born in South Africa, uh, Durban, South Africa. Um, my mom is from Zimbabwe or used to be. Not, wasn't called that then but um so I suppose that's a bit of my background immigrated when I was nine years old so I did some of my schooling in South Africa and the rest of it in Australia um I I guess that gives me a little bit of an understanding of what it's like to um adapt to a new culture even as uh, a white person and so I can only imagine that that is just even harder um for someone who is not white um my religious, I'm not religious, but my, I suppose, religious background would be Anglican, uh, also probably upper middle class, um, but my parents were not always in that class category. I'm the only academic in my family, but uh, I'm not the only researcher in my family. Um, I come from a split family. My mom has been separated twice, um, and so I have a uh, sister and a half sister and that kind of uh, family dynamic that's maybe a bit different to some. Uh, I'm a cis woman. Um, I went to school mostly and uh, university in Brisbane. Uh, moved to ANU for my job now as a, a postdoctoral fellow and my research is all on uh, stigma um, and social determinants of health and I I think what makes me passionate about that is my viewpoint is I would identify as a feminist and I see social justice issues in our day-to-day -day lives and I think psychology is one way to help us understand and address those issues um yeah I think I might leave it there <laughs> okay seeing anyone else Okay, um, so there is a contentious debate about positionality statements in the classroom, and we are not encouraging this practice as expected in classroom environments. Um, the reason we went through this today is so that just to sort of give you the opportunity to be more self-aware of the factors that affect your specific view of psychology or medicine, um, and to sort of emphasize some key factors of our own socially constructed view of reality. So I hope you were able to do that today. If you'd like to make a positionality statement in the classroom environment, it's unnecessary to provide this level of detail in your lectures. Simply acknowledging your racial and cultural background, that we are situated on stolen land and reflecting on your lens of psychology, such as taking a neural, developmental or social approach, is enough disclosure for our courses. The task, the task today was only to provide the opportunity to engage in self-awareness. So coming to the end of our presentation, here are some resources for some strategies to be more culturally responsive in the classroom. Um, these slides will go out with the strategy cheat sheet. Um, yeah, and 
this might seem like a lot to take in and due to the sensitivity in which we should approach cultural responsiveness, you may want to avoid it um, as to not make any mistakes. However, it is worse to do nothing. Think about the message you are sending if we don't try to do better. It's better to try and make some mistakes along the way and be corrected than stand aside and let students be harmed by our apathy. Let ANU be the role model for other universities to be more cult culturally responsive in the classroom, starting with SMP. And so now to leave us on like a motivational note, um, what are you gonna tackle first? And I expect you to answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Did it. Oh yeah, any questions, discussion? The Zoom can do so as well. I'm not sure how to check this one. Maybe okay. Thanks, Nicole. No comments. No questions, no comments. I'll say this. Yes. So yes, Mom. Like, I completely understand everything you said. It's all like great sense in theory. Yep. But like the, I just think about the reality of trying to implement these things. Yep. Really, I, and even when you think about the things that you do in the order, it's all part. Like, um, we have to have maybe seven or eight tutors that are all have their own teaching styles and trying to try to more and more we are half of keeping everything standardized because if you don't then students are like all oh, your advances in that lab versus this one so i think we're sort of battling the practicality of all this mm. as much as like this is really great i don't know how we tackle this in a way that is realistic mm. as a first step i think i guess so i guess that's, that's my worry about this the first step that mm. we should try and i think encourage students to do this we should try and do this ourselves but not going to be taken up to the same extent by everyone hmm. and that's going to create more imbalances and more students moaning at us for not doing things equal hmm. um i guess to repeat the question for the zoom mark was just wondering about the practicalities of implementing this stuff as obviously you've got lots of different tutors and then we want to make sure everything's standardized and everyone will have different uptakes. One thing to note is a lot of this stuff for tutors actually just makes them a good tutor. Like it's just educational practices. Off the top of my head, it's things like do the exercises you expect students to do before the tutorial. And that way when you come in, you can like lead more discussion, you know what's going on and students actually like to see that their tutors have also, you know, taken the quiz or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, a lot of the strategies, once you kind of look through them, it's like, wow, you're a good person and a good teacher. Pretty easy. Um, so I don't think you need to worry in terms of like, um, and on like, a, uh, not standardizing the like content between because it's just being a good teacher. In terms of things like, if you have a yeah, content and you're like, okay, how are we going to like critically analyze it? I mean, it's really like a one sentence thing of like, do we think that this um, study actually thought about people who were in like same sex relationships or who were neurodivergent or you know a big one for me is you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs who cares about that stuff if you're like in a war-torn country um, I guess it's I don't know how we can do about it practically but they're not that hard to think about it's just expanding your worldview which I believe is another thing but it's meant to be hard for people um yeah, it's just having these conversations. You can do them in tutor meetings as well. Be like, this is the content, get people talking about it. And that way people can be like, oh, wait, there's an ageism thing. Well, we should look about maybe gender, um, sexuality, all this stuff. Um, and so from there, once everyone's got that in their mind, because, you know, we assume everyone's a good person, um, they'll like take it on and bring it up as like limitations and things to discuss. If you want to make it standardized, just put it into the lecture tutor materials, I guess. I think, uh, yeah. Um, another thing probably is just that now that the, especially in psychology, now that the culture and psychology course is sort of like a mandated mm -hmm. yep. course that you have to take, a lot of the students um, that have taken that course are sort of expanding that knowledge and that sort of expectation onto other le lectures anyway. So they already have that, students usually come into the course once they've done the course, they tend to then, go on to like third year courses, other second year courses, also questioning this anyway. Mm -hmm. um, 
I know it is very difficult to then have to change a lot of the content. Um, but yeah, the main minimum thing that I would recommend would be implemented is just like a sentence to say that there is more models outside of this that you can research that are more mm -hmm. um, culturally re relevant to other cultures, other societies, et cetera. Um, just making a point about how this is the way in which this is taught, like, I don't know, developmental psychology or mm -hmm. um, stats or something, but that there are other, there is a wider context in psychology. I think just that sentence of saying that there is a wider context to psychology that you can research on your own. Um, and also just mentioning limitations in research that mm -hmm. there are. So when you share a study, um, we already do this in our research anyway, when we critically analyze, we then write out the limitations um, more generally, more broadly, or more specific to certain studies. Um, and I think that should also apply in lecture or lab content, just when you present research or when you present studies, then acknowledging what those limitations are. Maybe this group didn't focus on a certain cultural group, or maybe they overgeneralized to unrepresentative samples, things like that. Just making those little sort of commentaries while you're doing um, the labs and lectures. lectures, I think is hopefully the bare minimum that people can sort of bring up. Yeah. And one thing to note as well is if we, um, if you are, if you're meant to be, which we're supposed to be updating slide, like lecture material each year, if you want to like swap out something, swap in something culturally responsive, and then mm -hmm. maybe in like five years, your whole <laughs> content is like 80, 20 with like only like 20% Eurocentric yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. 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 We don't expect this to be like an immediate change. I mean, I would like of, to, but they keep telling me no. Yeah, we <laughs> just want a um point of perspective sort of to be shared to students just like in a statement or in certain slides just mm -hmm. saying that there is more that they can do in terms of learning psychology or yeah medicine things like that mm -hmm. yeah Tegan Tegan <laughs> thank you both for all of that I just thought I would offer an answer to your question really around um I, I think your your point about each year, if you like, mm -hmm. in your teaching material, trying to tackle one aspect of this mm -hmm. or something new. Um, I think just as an example, the two things that I've worked on this year in terms of my teaching materials, um, as an example for people, which might be helpful, is so one is that I've added a created uh, knowledge of the countryside because I'm terrified I'm going to forget. And having a slide is how you don't forget. Mm -hmm. And ANU, unlike many other institutions, does not have a standardised one, and they probably ought to. Um, like other universities have commissioned mm -hmm. art and things, so there's a standardised one that's recommended for use. Um, but you can find appropriate photos and, and text and, and create one for yourselves, or I'm very happy for anyone to borrow mine. Um, so I've created that this year. Another thing that I've done is in updating my lecture materials, just made a real point of making sure that all of the new studies that I'm citing are not by white American men. So, uh, making sure that there's diversity in terms of the country and the, and the background of the people whose work that I'm including. Um, and I think that's that didn't take me any extra time, really. That's just updating your slides. So um, maybe just as an example of the kinds of things you, you can't tackle it all at once, but mm -hmm. each year tackling one aspect of this. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have anything in the chat? Quiet on the chat? No. Any other last minute comments? No. Um, it's very, I had a little question. Yeah. This is not really for you guys, but more for the wider group around how to deal with appropriate or culturally unsafe comments from students in classes in a way that both is professional and doesn't risk you getting in trouble by doing or saying the wrong thing that then offends the, the person who said the comment, um, but also making sure that you are being clear that it's not um, okay um, and not being passive in that way. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on this. Or any like policies or guidelines speak to this that they The only thing I know about is that you generally want to take the student outside of the classroom. Maybe that's to take pressure off of yourself if you're the one 
for example, like a tutorial, um, whether you want to say first, I'm not comfortable with that kind of statement being made, mm. let's talk in the hallway, and then just removing some pressure from yourself um, to just give you some breathing room, I suppose. I'm not sure about spreading the message to the entire class mm. why that particular comment is inappropriate. I guess like it really depends on what's being said. Mm. Of it, but yeah, yeah. self out of the spotlight. Probably isn't too helpful because we haven't that concern. So we've been talking about procedures. So most of the um, ways we've talked to get from advice and spirit from others. Um, so the easy to think about when the person in the room that comes to charity became a point was usually the comments um, or you know, contemporary comments are raised outside of the purpose of presenting the material. So it's really important to first and then kind of give an option to say it just reminds students that we kind of redirect the conversation to the purpose of why we're actually discussing this and staying on track to the purpose of the content. Um once you kind of get through that redirection, you can always be just you know, sometimes it may not come from the intentions those comments. So it wasn't with respect um that student being free in future tutorials to feel comfortable raising things. Um, so the way in which our tutor dealt with that really well was then just to initiate a kind of a uh, break within the tutorial um, before moving on. So they actually have to back a little bit of material, skip the next section, which is perfectly fine, and just use their judgment. Um, then just kind of the natural breaks so and keep what I want to move down. Um, and then after the student outside is able to see how it's not going to be able to do that. I want to jump in. And say redirecting the conversation by saying, oh, this is off topic, isn't actually good enough. <laughs> um, depending on the level of what they've said, I've heard stories of like straight up problematic things being said. And you can, like, it's very clear that they are coming from like a place where they believe in that certain groups are just wrong, their existence is wrong, et cetera. And as a result, you can probably just be like, hey, that's very inappropriate to say. I always start my labs with a expectations in that you can't be saying things like that. Like you want to disagree with a student who thinks, what would be a good example? I don't know, like one scale in like personality is better than another. That's fine because it's like more on that. That's an okay way to disagree. But if you're saying, oh, all introverts are the worst, um, that's not okay, right? Um, other things to note is how I've dealt with it in my labs. They've kind of been in, they're like more of like the like gray area, right? So in one situation we were going, watching a video about kingship in indigenous Australian communities. And they mentioned something about um, like brothers, like a brother marrying his brother's wife later. And kind of how we, like we all know that the way people view marriage is human made. Um, so what I said when someone asked me like, hey, I kind of don't understand it. I tried to explain it from what I've understood, but all I knew is that how it works in terms of like Nigerian context. So I explained to students, I'm not entirely sure, don't even believe me, but this is what I think they mean. And then I said, we aren't judging them on what they've done. Like we have no opinion on it. We're not allowed to have an opinion on it. This is just how it is. I'm not saying whether it's like a right thing or a wrong thing. And that's a good way. The other time it came up is we were doing an exercise specifically related to the eight ways framework. And I asked students when they kind of did the exercise to kind of like learn about like how they learn. Um, I was like, oh, like, how did you feel about it? What was easy, what was hard? And someone was like, I just don't get it. Like, what do you mean? Where do you belong? Um, who do you belong to? Um, like, what do you mean? Like draw a picture of how you problem solve? Like, what is there like one way? Um, and I was like, oh, <laughs> so I was like, hmm. And then a student raised their hand to kind of, I think they were trying to like diffuse the situation, um, but it didn't help. And they're like, oh, like maybe this is how Indigenous Australians view like the IQ test. And I was like, no. Um, for example, we know that belongingness is a psychological concept if you study social identity theory. Um, and I just explained that it's like, that's not how we're supposed to view the task. It's not about whether we think these processes are only indigenous and it's like meant to be harder for us or something that like exists out there and like we can't get to it it's just something that you need to think about and if you haven't thought about it that's like fine but like I really redirected the discussion to show the strength 
of the um, activity. So while I didn't specifically like turn around to the student and be like, what is wrong with you? Um, why would you say that? I kind of made it clear that like, that was the wrong way of viewing it um, by showing them the correct way and using that type of like more neutral language, which is what we're so kind, of, kind of supposed to be doing anyway, because it's not an us versus them and Olivia has a hand. I think you had a really good point in your like presentation too when you were talking about how opinion is like what kind of ice cream mm. is, but if it's dehumanizing or putting down another group of people. Um, but I, I definitely get where you're coming from too, where you are, um, I think we have the same students this semester, although we have three or four days of students and they stop attending any sort of Um but I think that as a school, we really need to work on what our strategies are because um, I think this, uh, we've had students since this year in particular has had a lot of just redirection mm -hmm. and um, it's clearly impacting the other students in that cohort who um, started getting very, very upset even in the first lecture that we have this week at mm -hmm. what that they were saying. Mm -hmm. um, and it like, yeah, was, was really very upsetting for them to have to go through all of their courses with this person. Some continuity with the example that you just gave about when we redirect to the material, we redirect yeah. to the focus of why we're discussing this and the focus of how we can work it. So it was around prevalence and gender differences across the cycle of policies. And so then you redirect the focus of why we're looking at these trends. It's not to say men are better or mm. it's people being trans and things that not so if the other student can bring insurance, but after that second side to really explain it a bit more about the way in which you have to have those discussions, you can solve it. So, yeah. mm. Um, sorry, I am mindful that it is um five. So I also just wanted to make like one point more back to sorry to redirect no worries. um but yeah so again when it comes to the practicality of this I know like I said this is lifelong and ANU standing for very many generations um the starting point is pretty much just start a conversation about it so telling people that oh there are actually indigenous other indigenous frameworks that also cover um depression or that also look at different factors related to psychology that we don't cover here so maybe you can go and do that in your own time if you would like um but yeah and also understanding that it is difficult and to actually implement these things um this is sort of the start of saying that ANU needs to create uh like a discussion on how we can actually then put that into practice so we're here telling you that something is needs to be done and then from here on out it's sort of what as a community at ANU can we then do to actually put this into place so that's sort of where we're coming from is we're saying start having those conversations and then start building on how you can actually put that change and implement that into the classroom over the next five years ten years etc until you're finally at a point where you're you know APAC is happy and also <laughs> students are happy with the whole being culturally responsive thing so yeah final note that was it because it's five so um well thank oh, you so much to all of our presenters um just a round of applause um and we will wrap up there but i'm sure uh, if these conversations continue to happen offline um that is also fantastic too so please let's not end the conversation here um but maybe we can take it to badger because we have a table book <laughs> at badger um now so please do join us for um some drinks and um some social time and next week we have um our seminar from 12 to 1 at innovations um so please join us then as well thank you everyone <laughs>